So I'd like to uh, reintroduce and welcome our keynote speaker, Mariam Namaze of the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. Thank you very much. Again, uh, for those who weren't here in the morning session, I apologize for not being here uh, throughout the conference. Um, I'm really glad to be here, um, and I'm, I'm really happy for the discussions that we've been having so far. Um, I think in this day and age, um, Islam matters because of Islamism. Islam, per se, is fundamentally no different from other religions. The tenets, dogma, principles of all religions are, are the same. They're equal. I don't believe in good or bad religions. In my opinion, all religion is bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> religion, religion should come with a health warning like cigarettes. Religion kills. But even so, today as we speak, there is a distinction to be made between religions in general and Islam in particular. But not for any other reason than that it is the ideology behind a far-right regressive movement that has state power in many places, with Sharia law, brutal and criminal Sharia law being implemented uh, in many parts of the world and now one of the most implemented legal codes worldwide. Islam matters to us today because we are living under an Islamic inquisition and not because it is becoming more popular as its proponents like to argue. They call it the fastest growing religion. I personally like a count of how many of us are leaving it and how many would like to leave if they were allowed to. <laughs> Islam's appeal has not grown amongst the general public. In fact, it's the opposite. Its record in political power speaks volumes for itself. Stonings, honor killings, amputations, child marriages, sexual apartheid, decapitations, bombs in discotheques and buses, the slaughter of entire generations in the Middle East and North Africa. It is the difference between Christianity today and Christianity during the Inquisition. A religion that has been reined in by an enlightenment is very different, is very different from one that is spearheading an inquisition. That's why anything from downloading information on the internet on women's rights, like Parvi's Kambakhsh did in Afghanistan, to the name of a teddy bear, to caricatures on Muhammad, become matters of life and death. Under an inquisition, things like Islamic feminism, Liberal, and interpretation, liberal interpretations of Islam, these are all in quotes for me, Islamic reformism, Islamic democracy, Islamic human rights are impossible. A personal religion is impossible under an inquisition. You can't pick and choose as you like. Islamists, Islamists will kill and intimidate anyone who interprets things differently, who thinks freely, and who transgresses their norms by living 21st century lives. One of the characteristics of an inquisition is a total ban on free thinking and policing of thought. Censorship is rife, and one can face the death penalty for reading a book or visiting an internet, internet site. Giordano Bruno was burnt at the stake for heresy in 1600. People are being killed today for heresy, for blasphemy, for apostasy. Under an inquisition, torture is the norm. According to their handbook at the time, inquisitors were instructed not to find any accused innocent under any circumstances. The same applies for Islamism. You are guilty full stop. You are guilty for laughing. You are guilty for dancing. You are guilty for not wearing the veil, for listening to music, for wearing jeans, for driving, for loving, for thinking and for breathing. The purpose of the so-called Sharia justice system is to elicit a conversation, a confession, sorry. In Iran, for example, Press TV, which is a media outlet based in London, has actually broadcast confessions, so-called confessions of people tortured, and they've had a hand in actually telling the, the uh, prisoners what they're supposed to say. Sakina Mohammad Yashjani, who faces death by stoning in Iran, is one example. Under an inquisition, you were killed even if you confessed. A confession would just mean that you would be strangled before you were burnt at the stake, rather than being burnt alive. The same applies for Islamism. It's a killing machine. Sharia law is designed to teach the masses the damnable nature of dissent. Moreover, under an inquisition, you, once you're baptized, it's, it can't be undone. The same is true with Islam. You're not allowed to leave. 
Of course, there are distinctions in the practice of Islamism, as in every phenomenon, but it is a question of degrees. A little less vile is still repugnant. The misogyny and inhumanity behind a law that stones people to death in Afghanistan and Somalia is the same one that denies women the right to divorce and child custody in Britain. Have our expectations been so lowered after all that we have seen and heard that there are still those who say that a reformist, liberal and a softer version of Islam and Islamism is possible and tolerable? These notions would have been ridiculed by the avant-garde of the Enlightenment. It is an insult. It is an insult to humanity. Religion in general, and Islam in particular, can only be considered liberal and reformed, at face value at least, when it is pushed in a corner and out of the public space, when it is forced to run soup kitchens rather than courts and Islamic assemblies. If you look at Christianity, for example, it's not the tenets, dogma, and principles of Christianity that's changed. It hasn't become more humane since the days of the Inquisition. What's changed is its social and political influence in today's society, in people's lives, its relation to the state, to the law, to the educational system. To the degree that it has been undermined and weakened, that is the degree that people have managed to free themselves from the clutches of religion. And have, and have happier lives and a better society. Progressive human values have been achieved at the expense of Christianity and religion. And the same has to be done with Islam and Islamism. It is being done, but by people living under Islamic laws or those who have fled them and sought refuge in the West. During the anti-Christianity enlightenment, the raging debate against religion was raised by elites and intellectual giants, which eventually filtered down to popular culture. Now it's the other way around. It's bubbling from below. Whilst many intellectuals and elites are either in bed with the Islamists or excuse it as people's culture. After all, whose culture are we talking about? Sakina Mohammad Yashtiani, who's been educated only until fifth grade, who wants to live, or the Islamic Republic of Iran's culture, who wants to stone her to death? Whose? Sakina's 22-year-old transport worker son, Sajjad, who's never left Iran, but writes open letters to the people of Iran, uh, to the people of the world, asking them to defend his mother and help save, his life, save her life. Given the havoc that Islamism is wreaking worldwide, concepts such as Islamic reformism or liberalism and labels such as Islamic societies and communities deliberately or inadvertently become part of the effort to Islamicize societies and communities and hand them over lock, stock and barrel to the regressive and parasitical Islamic organizations, imams and states. After all, there are innumerable characteristics that define people and people define themselves by in this day and age. But all we seem to be identified nowadays by is religion. This has a lot to do with the rise of Islamism and a new world order that has pushed back concepts of citizenship and universalism. Within this context, labeling people as Muslim and Muslim alone is actually part of the process which constrains them in order for despicable Islamic organizations and states to feign representation of them, but also to limit their rights. Any attempt to promote good versus bad versions of Islam and Islamism are also very much the same. If you want a cuddlier version of Islam, get rid of Islamism. That doesn't mean, of course, that there are many Muslims or those labeled as such who are humanist, secularist, moderate, feminist, liberal, atheist, socialist, communist or have other viewpoints, but that is not one and the same with Islam being the, such. After all, not everyone who is a Muslim is an Islamist. There are innumerable political parties, civil society, social movements with various beliefs and values and classes. By boxing people into a homogeneous community of Muslims, you shrink the space people have to breathe and to move, and you give authority to the Islamists. And it ignores the fact, by doing this, that Muslims, or those labeled as such, are actually the first victims of Islamism. They're the first victims of Sharia law. 
and they are at the forefront of battling it. It ignores the slaughtered generations, buried in mass graves, hung in city centers, stoned and hacked to death, and ignores the resistance that takes place day in and day out against Islamism. Nowhere, nowhere is opposition greater against Islamism than in countries under Islamic rule. Condemning Islamism and Islam is not a question of judging all Muslims and equating them with terrorists. There is a distinction between Islam as a belief system and Islamism as a political movement on the one hand and real life human beings on the other. Neither the far right nor the pro-Islamist left seem to see this distinction. Both are intrinsically racist. The pro-Islamist left and many liberals imply that people are one and the same with the Islamic states and movements that are repressing them. And the far right blames all immigrants and Muslims for the crimes of Islamism. It's important here to note that Islamism was actually not concocted in some immigrant's kitchen in London, but was actually very much part of US foreign policy during the Cold War, of creating a green belt against the Soviet Union at that time. Both the far right and the pro-Islamist left purport that Islamism is people's culture and they actually deserve no better, imputing on innumerable people the reactionary elements of culture and religion, which is that of the ruling class, imams and self-appointed community leaders. Their politics ignores the distinction between oppressed and the oppressor and actually sees them as one and the same. It denies universalism, sees rights as Western, and justifies the suppression of rights, freedoms, and equalities for others. Civil rights, freedom, equality, secularism, modernism are universal concepts that have been fought for, that have been fought for tooth and nail by progressive social movements and working class in various countries. And as a result, they belong to everybody. But because of these politics of multiculturalism, concepts such as rights, equality, respect, and tolerance, which were initially raised vis-a-vis -vis the individual, are now more and more applicable to culture and religion and take precedence over real life human beings. Moreover, the social inclusion of people into society has come to mean inclusion of their beliefs, sensibilities, concerns and agendas, and nothing more. This distinction between humans and their beliefs and regressive political movements is of crucial significance here. It is the human being who is meant to be equal, not his or her beliefs. It is the human being who is worthy of the highest respect and who is sacred, not his or her beliefs, or those imputed on them. The problem is that religion sees things the other way around, and this is why religion must be relegated to a private matter. In the face of this onslaught, secularism, universalism, values worthy of 21st century have to be defended and promoted unequivocally. As I said in the earlier panel, unfortunately, since Richard Dawkins is here as well. Unfortunately, a lot of our time is spent, I'm not sure why, criticizing him rather than religion, which we need to be doing much more strongly and aggressively, I think. Today also, because we're at an atheist forum, is we need to the dereligionization of society, not as a private affair, but against the religion industry, which is not held accountable and c carries out murder and mayhem at will. And we also need an acknowledgement of the Islamic Inquisition and real solidarity with and strengthening of the anti-Islamic enlightenment bubbling from below that despises Islamism and Islamic morality, scorns the clergy, actually burns Qur'ans in demonstrations and rejects an ordained social hierarchy. Not more of the same attempts at rescuing Islam and Islamism over the dead bodies of our beloved. I'm going to end here by giving a quote of Mansur Hekmat, uh, uh, as one of my aims is to get rid of Islamism, and I know we're going to succeed, uh, because justice requires that it be so. Uh, one of my other aims is for people to know him, uh, he, because he has actually been one of the inspirations for many of the socialists, secularists, humanists, atheists in, in the Middle East. I'm going to end with a pretty long quote of him, because I think he always says it the best. But he says, I realize that the interests of those, of some, require that they rescue Islam as much as possible from the wrath of those who have witnessed the indescribable atrocities or been victimized by Islamists. I also realize that the extent of some of these atrocities and holocausts is such that even some Islamists themselves 
do not want to take responsibility for them. So it is natural that the debate on true Islam versus practical Islam is broached over and over again. These justifications, however, are foolish from my point of view and from the points of views of those of us who have seen or been the victims of Islam's crimes. They are foolish for those of us who are living through a colossal social, political and intellectual struggle with this beast. The doctrinal and Quranic foundations of Islam, the development of Islam's history and the political identity and affiliation of Islam and Islamists in the battle between reaction and freedom in our era are too obvious to allow the debate on the various interpretations of Islam and the existence or likelihood of other interpretations to be taken seriously. In Islam, whether it's a true Islam or an untrue Islam, the individual has no rights or dignity. In Islam, the woman is a slave. In Islam, the child is on par with animals. In Islam, free thinking is a sin that deserves punishment. Music is corrupt. Sex without permission and religious certification is the greatest of sins. This is the religion of death. In reality, all religions are such. But most religions have been restrained by free thinking and freedom-loving humanity over hundreds of years. This one was never restrained or controlled. With every move, it brings abominations and misery. Moreover, in my opinion, defending the existence of Islam under the guise of respect for people's culture and beliefs is hypocritical and lacks credence. There are various beliefs amongst people. The question is not about respecting people's beliefs, but about which are worthy of respect. In any case, no matter what anyone says, everyone is choosing beliefs that, they are, that are to their liking. Those who reject a criticism of Islam under the guise of respecting people's beliefs are only expressing their own political and moral preferences, full stop. They choose Islam as a belief worthy of respect and package their own beliefs as the people's beliefs, only in order to provide populist legitimation for their own choices. I will not respect any superstition or the suppression of rights, even if all the people in the world believe it to be so. Of course, I know it is the right of all to believe in whatever they want, but there is a fundamental difference between respecting the freedom of opinion of individuals and respecting the opinions that they hold. We are not sitting in judgment of the world. We are players and participants in it. Each of us are party to this historical worldwide struggle, which in my opinion, from the beginning of time until now, has been over the freedom and equality of human beings. Thank you. That's a bit embarrassing, thank you. Thanks so much, Miriam. Uh, we'll take some uh, questions from the floor. Uh, if it is possible, I'd like to take questions and comments and then maybe answer after a certain time so I'm not monopolizing the question and answer Just time. Just take a few questions. Yeah, is that all right? Or yeah, comments? Sure, if you'd like yeah. to do um, Yes, um, Islamophobia is a term which has recently acquired the opprobrium, uh, which was once reserved for racism. And uh, it really says more about the person who uses it than about the person it's directed at. I was wondering what uh, you think we should do to combat this term. Uh, this is just a comment for people who haven't heard it before. I wonder if your softer version of Islam could be called Mullah Light. The adaptation of uh, Britain, or may maybe it will happen here in due course, to um, Islamism and uh, the liberals whom you criticised for letting it go, letting it continue, has its origins a long time ago. Uh, I'm sure originally to do with the Christian people uh, seeing Jews as separate, but it really rose strongly here and in Britain from the Christian Reformation 1520 or so, so that it certainly contributed to uh, Ireland uh, from becoming independent in 1922, that the government ever has, the government, the independence movement in Ireland would have counted 
the tribe of people here as identified with Roman Catholicism and very much the tribe of Britain whom they're trying to get away from as Protestant. So since then, since 1922 then, the government here views the provision of education certainly and perhaps other items as they provide it to tribes. So the state and some people, a lot of people who don't think enough about it are so used to a country being divided into tribes is when a new tribe, that is Muslims, come in. They treat them as a tribe and just as say the government here when they want um, the opinion from Roman Catholic people about what education or any other issue, they consult the bishops who of course are not elected. So similarly, uh, uh, the government here, if the same thing happened as in Britain, an awful lot more Muslim people coming in, and there are some already, the same thing could happen because the government is liable to treat um, the ordinary people who happen to belong to Islam and the prominent leaders as together and they treat them as a tribe and just like the Christian brothers were entitled to beat us in school when we were kids uh, and similar things, uh, the, it would be the same as you're describing in Britain that uh, the state would treat uh, the supposed leaders and the ordinary people who are Muslims as one together and that with the assumption that every single of the thousands of people who are Muslims fully accepting the leaders who, of course, are not so nice people. Hi. Um, oh, thank you. Um, my name is Adnan Rashid. I'm from Islamic Education Research Academy, London. Um, your speech was quite passionate. Uh, I admire you for that. But you sounded, I mean, this is my humble opinion, I don't know if you'll agree with this, you sounded like an Iranian mullah, uh, very aggressive. I mean, you even used the term uh, in, during your speech that we need to be more aggressive. It doesn't help the atheists to be aggressive to the people of religion, because if anything, if anything, <laughs> the people of religion, uh, they think that atheists are just like those inquisitors in the past, and if they come to power, they will eradicate any kind of religion from the face of the, this earth. Coming to the point of Sharia law, I mean, you raised some interesting points during your passionate speech. If you study some of the modern academic studies, I mean, I'm a historian myself from the University of London, and I have studied extensively. I mean, I've been studying Sharia law for 10 years almost. And I've studied some of the, stu um, um, some of the works by some modern historians and academics um, about the Sharia law and its fruit. Some of them argue that Sharia law, in fact, was one of the best things which happened to mankind. Let me elaborate. Let me elaborate. I know it's funny. I know it's very funny. Um, but let, let's see if it's funny when I finish. Um, one of those people is from SOAS, uh, Professor Thomas Arnold. He stated in his book, Preaching of Islam, that Islam saved many of the minor Christian sects and the Jewish religion from extinction. <laughs> from the Catholic Church or the, the persecutor of the Church. Then you talked about the Enlightenment. If you study the history of Enlightenment, a lot of the enlightened works were coming from the Islamic lands, such as Islamic Spain, Al-Andalus, and the food was directly the food of Sharia. It was a Sharia law which enabled the masses to come together in a protected uh, society where the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims could work together in harmony and produce the result which we saw uh, in enlightenment. So there is a side which you presented which is kind of very vicious and there's another side to it which is presented by the academics and historians of the University of London. One, one such people is Charles Burnett. I don't know if he's an atheist or a Christian but he's not definitely not a Muslim. Charles Burnett, he has written extensively on the influence of Islam on the European intellectual um, tradition and he argues also that Islam played a major role in the enlightenment of Europe and civilize, civilizing the Europeans. So Sharia law, Sharia law had good fruits as well. Can you talk this fruit as well? Yes, Please. Uh, Thank you. Uh, when you use the word fruit it reminds me of that song, um, uh, you know, the, the a new Samoan song about fruit hanging from trees, strange fruit, that's exactly, and it's actually talking about black lynching, 
uh, lynching of black people that took place in, in America. Uh, that, that is the fruit of Sharia law. Um, but but let, me, let me just say this. I, I, I find it very interesting, and I'm really glad you brought this up, because this is something that I have on my chest, and I wanted to make sure that I do say here, uh, is um, when people were talking about um, them, and they're Islamists, they're not Muslims, don't, don't be mistaken and fooled for that, uh, by that, is that, you know, oh, they, they sound very reasonable. And I think one of the things is that they're quite savvy, just because they don't have the sword of Islam showing uh, on their uh, belts, uh, and just because uh, they're not uh, advocating it in the way that maybe someone like Anjum Chaudhary, who wants Sharia law for Britain and the whole world, is advocating it, doesn't make them any different. And I think this was what my argument was about, being careful about these things. And what's interesting is I'm aggressive, I'm being unreasonable, and those that kill me, and want to kill me and threaten me for what I say are the reasonable ones. Atheism. You, you can leave this meeting safely and not worry about your life and look over your shoulder. A lot of people, I have not finished yet, please wait till I finish and then you can raise another question, please. A lot of people do not have that safety and security, not just and we're not just talking about Iran, Iraq, and elsewhere. You're talking about right here in the heart of Europe. You have, and it's not just ex-Muslims. You have someone like um, Osama Hassan. He's a, an imam at a mosque in East London. Because he's come out to defend women's rights, he has received death fatwas. You have Sharia uh, Hatun. She's a woman counselor, a Muslim woman counselor in the Tower Hamlets. She has received death threats because she doesn't want to be veiled. You have a woman in East London working in the pharmacy who've had Islamists come and tell her if she's not veiled, she's not even Muslim, but because she's Asian, if she's not veiled, they will, not, uh, they will uh, start a campaign boycotting uh, that pharmacy and therefore she's actually been given uh, time off and most probably will be fired from her job. And you have stickers all over Tower Hamlet saying it's a gay free zone. So do not tell us about aggression because Speaking your mind, this is freedom of expression, the right to speak, the right to speak. That is the only vehicle, the right to organize, the right to mobilize, is the only vehicles we, victims and survivors and resistors of Sharia law, have against it. And so, so no, no, it is nothing like the mullahs in Iran. And it is nothing um, like, like the Islamists here in Britain as well. Uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, it, and it's interesting that you raised some of the academics that you talk about. Well, those are the exact academics I said. You had in the past, in the anti-Christian enlightenment, intellectual giants coming out in defense of people against religion. Now you have academics at SOAS and here and there defending Islam, defending multiculturalism, defending misogyny, defending inhumanity in the 21st century. Now, the other thing about Sharia, well, you know, I'm not going to ask the question because, you know, it'll never end, but for those of you who are debating them, and there's, I don't think there is a need to do that, but if you are going to have a conversation with them, ask them what they think about stoning. Is that part of Sharia law? And wait for a, don't wait for a, you know, a, a, have you heard of US-led militarism and the Palestinian issue? Yeah, yeah, we're against that too, but stoning. Is stoning in Sharia law? Is a woman's testimony worth half that of a man's in Sharia law? Does, um, do men have the right to unilateral divorce and women don't? Is child custody given to a man at a preset age, irrespective of the welfare of the child? Is there amputation? Is there eye for an eye retribution and resource? Is there uh, 130 offenses punished by, by death from, sexual, from being gay, to being an apostate, to being a heretic, to being a blasphemer? So those are questions I would like you to ask and wait for a straight answer because you'll never get it. You'll never get it. No, I, I want to address other questions too because I don't want you. The to microphone is up. You, the can, microphone you can is take up you can take other opportunities to talk, but I do want to also address other people in this audience who've asked me questions. Now, on the issue of Islamophobia, on the issue of Islamophobia, I think uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, uh, what's happened is again Islamophobia. The term is used as a way of silencing criticism against Islam and silencing criticism against Islamism. And by using that term, it sort of gives the impression that it's like homophobia or like xenophobia. It's not. It's not because you, 
you know, what's wrong with being f having a phobia against a religion? I know I have it, you know, and, and isn't it well deserved? You know, but I do want to add, I do want to add something that's crucial is that racism exists. Look at the far right, honestly. Um, they are so despicable. To me, they are like the Islamists. And I think we have to be very careful to defend people irrespective of their beliefs and uh, not having any beliefs. Uh, defend Muslims as equal citizens under the law, um, equal um, uh, and with, with having universal rights. But at the same time saying that a criticism of religion is a necessity. It's, it's why freedom of expression matters. If we're going to be talking about recipes, well, that's not really freedom of expression. It's where it's taboo, where it's sacred. That's where it matters. That's where uh, you, you manage to... That, that's how uh, we've progressed throughout history, is by criticizing primarily re religion. And I do also want to stress the fact that I think it's hugely important not to mix Muslims with Islam and Islamism. Because the reality of the matter is, even though um, you know, Islamists will say otherwise, that Sharia law, for example, if you just take the example of Sharia law in Britain, it came into being in the mid-80s after the establishment of an Islamic Republic in Iran. It's not because Muslims are more pious. They didn't need Sharia courts 40 years ago, but they need them now. The reason is, the reason is, and the only reason is, is because Sharia law is a vehicle for Islamism to limit citizen rights, to limit it. And therefore, I think we need to make a distinction. Muslim immigration has nothing to do with it. Islamism does, as does very often Western government complicity in supporting and defending Islamism. British troops are setting up Sharia courts in Afghanistan as we speak. Um, I, I told you earlier, uh, for, for those who, who were here in the, in the morning session, that you know, I read uh, the story of this woman in Afghanistan whose time is up in jail, but she's been languishing in prison for months because no male relative will pick her up to help take her out. And, she, and women, sexual apartheid is the norm, and women are not allowed to move or travel without their male guardian's permission. Um. I really wanted to uh, quickly um, add on to what the uh, first uh, commenter was saying about Islamophobia. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware with uh, Pat Condell, um, but he has a brilliant video about that, uh, about the myth of Islamophobia. There is no such thing as Islamophobia, because what is a phobia? It's an irrational fear, mm -hmm. but it's a rational fear. <laughs> It's, there's no such thing as a phobia of a maniac axe murderer. So how can we have a phobia of Islam, which is stoning and, and killing, and it doesn't exist. I think it's the same, it's the same problem that's just been raised. Um, what Gert Wilders is doing is using popular opinion for his own political gain. He is trying to sway uh, against immigration uh, and uh, of, of people out, outside coming into, into the Netherlands because there's a lot of popular thought that it's doing the country's economy down. And he's using uh, arguments against Islam. In fact, he's, he's just being tried at this moment uh, for... Um, things that he said against Islam and against Muslims, uh, which he's only using for political gain uh, to, to stir up grassroots hatred of immigrants. It has nothing to do with Islam. I don't think the man has, uh, is, is the slightest bit interested. I think he's interested in his fascist regime and he's using uh, popular thought to create this kind of false Islamophobia. It isn't anything of the sort. It's actually just uh, a different way of being racist and being and, and being intolerant of hum other human beings. Thank you. Um, really, just after that, my question is almost redundant, um, but it's a, a follow-on on that. We're seeing not just Wolfram Wilders, but also in other countries in Europe the far European right adopting essentially secular and atheist positions on Islam. 
And as Anne-Marie said yesterday, we've got this sort of weird intermingling of racism and religion, and using that to actually push their own agendas. And what I would be interested in is how can we actually combat that? How can we go against that and actually say, look, our position is very different mm -hmm. from what the right is doing. Mm -hmm. And we don't agree with that. And you know, we, we really want to push our position of saying, get rid of the religion. This has nothing to do with race. This has nothing to do with individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think I'll just respond quickly to these because they are linked. And, um, um, I do have a lot to say on them, but I'm going to try to keep brief. How much more time do we have? Oh, oh. okay. Um, well, I, I I agree with you on, uh, with a lot of things actually you've said today. Um, so uh, it, it's great that we get to meet people who we, we feel very close to uh, politically and and otherwise. And um, I mean, I think that um, Geert Wilders has a right to his freedom of expression. He shouldn't be tried for what he said. Unless, of course, it's inciting to hatred and all, and then there are criminal laws regarding that, and people can be tried under those laws. In fact, if, that, if actually those laws were practiced, a lot of the Islamists would be in jail right now um, for, for threatening, uh, but somehow they never get arrested. Um, I think the, the thing with, uh, you know, the discussion we had earlier in the morning about secular coalitions, I think this is an excellent example of why how you get to something is just as important as what you're trying to get to. And I think, uh, you know, we're facing this a great deal with the uh, battle against Sharia law. You suddenly have all these fascists coming forward and, and you're actually supported by the right. And being on the left, I find this so uncomfortable. And then you have the left that are actually joining marches of al Mahajirun and, and, you know, and uh, the, the Islamic fascists, even though they're supposed to be anti-fascist. You know, it's just, it's a real mess here. And I think, I mean, my argument is that it's quite easy. You know, I can be opposed to the Islamic Republic of Iran and not feed into U.S. the militarism. You know, I can be against both. And I think the problem is that because good people are staying silent, uh, the far right is the only one that seems to be vocal on this issue. But also, there's a huge wave of censorship against people like me. You know, the amount of times I've been interviewed and it hasn't been broadcast, the amount of places I've gone to that venues have been cancelled, that newspapers have refused to uh, put the advertisement of my speaking engagement there. Whereas very easily in those very universities and those very newspapers, Islamists are, are often advertised. You know, So in that sense, it, it's not that it doesn't exist. I think we represent a majority, but it's impossible to get to that state. And I think that's why what we're doing is mobilizing and organizing people at a grassroots level so that the explosion will be, will be heard at the state level and in the media level. Um, but I do want to say that, I mean, Geert Wilders exactly is um, a, an example of how this battle <coughs> can't take place. Because what would you do if uh, people like me weren't in Europe? I mean, if you look at the battle against Sharia law and Islamism, against honor killings, against child veilings, against um, um, uh, faith schools, uh, many of those battles are actually being uh, led by, not just in Britain, but in Sweden, in Norway, in, uh, in, in the Netherlands, by people who, are, uh, who have fled Islamic law. Uh, and in a sense, uh, it's it sort of, you know, the argument that just because someone comes from Iran doesn't necessarily make them uh, like Ahmadinejad. You and I can have a lot more in common than myself and an Iranian. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, in a sense, when you group people according to nationality and uh, ethnicity and religion, this is what happens. Uh, and, and the fact that we're labeled Muslim no matter what, you know. Um, j just an interesting story, I was invited to speak at... Um, a, a secular society meeting in one of the uh, cities in, in England. And uh, I, had, I was invited because I was Secularist of the Year winner in 2005. And at the minute I got there, they were distributing wine and they said, oh, do you mind if we drink wine here? And I thought, this is an uphill battle, honestly, an uphill battle. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think in, in a sense, in the battle against, uh, against religion, um, against Islamism, in a way I think if we focus on being anti-religion, which is crucial, that's what happened in the Enlightenment as well, um, it, it will help separate us from the far right because they're not anti-religion, they love Christian fundamentalism, they love bishops in the House of Lords and, you know, they just don't like that foreign religion, you know. And I think that's one way of making a distinction. The other is secularism, they hate secularism. 
Um, and I think if we push and focus on these issues, uh, this will distinguish us. But we need to be seen because a vast majority of people need to see us to be able to join us. And I think that's where it's going to take a lot more recognition by the atheist, humanist, secularist movement of the Islamic Inquisition and recognition of those fighting on the front lines. And that's something I'd like to talk to you about when, when I get a chance. I don't want to... Um, uh, take the question time up, but about you know my frustrations at the lack of support, financial, moral, and otherwise, that we are getting uh, from a movement that we feel so, we, which we are part of. Um, but also, I think what happens is when good people, decent people, the left, progressives are silent on the issue, you have uh, people like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Wafa Sultan being pulled towards the right. Do you know what I mean? They become, they have to go to U.S. Uh, ooh, think tank, sorry, that sent shivers down my spine. Or, um, you know, uh, Wafa Sultan, uh, she defends US-led militarism and actually promotes Christianity. So that's why the ex-former Muslims of America haven't joined our coalition of ex-Muslims here, because we are firmly an atheist organization and movement. But, so, so I'm saying that uh, we lose a lot, and we lose a lot of good people, and people who need support but aren't getting it, aren't getting it, and I think that's where recognition and support and solidarity, and I think what stops solidarity um, is the fact that it's their issue, not ours, uh, and I think going back to the concept of universalism, you know, human beings first and at the center of everything, will help us move ahead and push back Islamism to the hole that it deserves to go into. Just to pick up on exactly that point that the, the Kurt Wilders and the George Bushes of this world are the recruiting sergeants for the Bin Ladens and the uh, Abu Hamzas, which I completely agree with you on. My question is, how do we as secularists try to engage with the, the, what I would call the moderate Muslim majority? I mean, I think a lot of people in this room probably are in, inspired by the Arab uprising that's happening right now. Um, my feeling is if our first point to them is, hey, by the way, you do realize the Quran's nonsense and there's no God, they're probably going to switch off. Whereas if we open with, hey, listen, what you're doing is brilliant, we support human rights, what can we do to help? And then later on we can have the conversation about God. I feel that's a more realistic way. Maybe I'm being naive in, in thinking we don't have to have the God conversation immediately. But what is the best way? Because we're interested in engaging with reasonable Muslims about you know, freedom and human rights. What's the best way to start that conversation? Well, mine is not actually a question, but um, I, I would just want to say I'm angered by, by the comparison from the Muslim speaker that, that um, she sounds like a mullah. She's not the one um, finishing her speech with a command for all atheists around the world to arm ourselves and kill religious people left and right. So how dare you co compare her with, with a mullah? And, and secondly, I have to say I spoke to him before this, just now, before the speech started, and I asked him about the Sharia law, and I did not get a straight answer, so there you go. I, I have actually, I asked Hamza on Twitter about Sharia law, does Sharia law include stoning, yes or no, and I got an answer, he said drugs are completely forbidden in Islam, so no, we don't get stoned. <laughs> He had the opportunity to give a straight answer and he chose to make a joke. So either he has a straight answer or doesn't. Uh, we have time for just one last comment or question. Hello? Oh. Um, I think that when we're talking about sort of Muslim people being compared to, you know, people in the Middle East as a whole. I think we're, you're right, we're absolutely making really the wrong comparisons and that does lead to sort of racism. So why don't, instead of that, when we're talking about abuses of people, you know, by Islamists or by sort of like, you know, radical sort of Islamic um, fundamentalists or whatnot, why don't we just compare them to what we have here? We're saying, we compare that not to other things going on in the Middle East, but talk about the people who are stuck in inst Catholic institutions right now. Talk about the abuses that have been going on in Ireland. Compare it to the extremists we have here and make that be the people we compare these people to, not all of the immigrants coming in or whatnot. I just think that'd be... Uh, I mean, I, I think, um, 
Yes, I think we must have coalitions. Uh, we discussed this at length in the morning session. We must have coalitions with all people with, when it comes to certain issues, obviously, right? So if, for example, in the campaign we've started against Sharia law in Britain, Muslims, non-Muslims, whoever wants to agree on that issue, on that on the manifesto, is welcome to join. But if you have someone who says, "Well, sure, I don't want um, it called Sharia law," we did have this argument with some people as well. We actually denied the, um, we delayed announcing the campaign for two weeks to talk with women's rights groups, who eventually, after a year, did join us. By the way, uh, and that's part of organizing and mobilizing and getting people to start thinking about things in a different way. Uh, but, you know, when they said, well, we'll join if you don't mention the word Sharia, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> can't do that. Um, you know, or we'll join if you, um, you know, um, uh, don't say that all faith schools are bad, just some are, you know. Well, as long as there's monitoring, that's good enough. No, sorry, faith schools are bad. You know, if, if you agree, if we agree on principles, and that's where it's important, where, you know, coalitions are not good enough just for the sake of having coalitions. I mean, the amount of interfaith coalitions we've seen that just perpetrate more religion and strengthen it and encourage it in society is just proof of why that is a major failure and that we need coalitions on certain issues, as you say. Um, and, and that is important. Um, but I, I think at the same time, you know, if we understand, if we understand the climate that we live in, if we agree that we live under an Islamic inquisition, then we need to speak out about religion. We need to do it. And people can handle it. People can handle it. Why do you think Muslims are different from you? You know, uh, my father, he's a Muslim. My grandfather was a mullah, but because of the anti-Islamic backlash in Iran, my aunts actually photoshopped his turban out. Uh, <laughs> seriously. And uh, my dad says, don't call him a mullah. If you call him a mullah one more time, I'm going to kill you. No, not really, but... Um, <laughs> But he says, call him an Islamic scholar as if that's any better. But you know, my dad will always tell me, oh my God, grand grandpa is turning in his grave with the things you say. But why do you think that Muslims can't take a criticism of religion? They're human. Uh, and they can, they can handle it. Trust me, they can handle it. They can handle a criticism of uh, uh, religion and Islam. I, I think actually uh, the problem is you can't handle it, not that they can't handle it. And I guess that's my argument here, is that people in Iran are burning Qur'ans and veils on the street. Uh, a, recent, uh, a few um, months ago, uh, it was televised, a mullah, who's also in parliament, they're all mullahs, uh, came to the parliamentary meeting late, and it was televised. They said, well, why are you so late? Because no taxi would pick me up. I had to go change into street clothes and then come so I could actually get a cab to come here. The hatred against the clergy, the hatred against Islamic groups, you can't feel that. There is an anti-Islamic backlash in Iran. And you're worried about talking about religion. If you don't, you're behind. You're behind the movements there. You're behind it, whereas you should actually be supporting it and leading it and, and helping it in, in many different ways. So I do want to... Um, uh, you know, uh, not start with these assumptions that because someone is Muslim or from Iran or from, you know, Somalia, they can't handle these things. Um, and I, I, I guess, uh, since we don't have too much time and I should end, I, I just want to say that, you know, uh, I think uh, in a lot of sense, uh, we are the hope for um, how this world can turn out. You know, it could, we could keep ignoring the, the matters and leave people uh, to fend for themselves in communities, in our own cities, or in, in countries across the world. Or we can actually start taking this, this seriously and step in, step into this battle. And I'm not saying you're not, I'm sure you are more than most people, I'm, I'm speaking generally. Um, I, I think it is the battle of our time, and I think it is our du the duty that we have, a historical duty at hand, and one that we need to realize and we need to take, uh, take charge on. As Master Hickman said, this is a historical, a monumental battle with a beast. Are we going to meet that challenge? And are we going to be able, with, by meeting it, by fighting it, by pushing it back, uh, bring about a society in which we can be hopeful for our children to grow in? Thank you. Sorry, I'm not just making it up.
we'll be having our closing with uh, Michael Nugent in, a, in about five minutes' time. Thank you.